Yeah, okay, hey, hi. <laughs> uh, my name is Joshua Watt, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, software bill of materials uh, with the Octa Project and Open Embedded. A little bit about myself. I have been working at Garmin in the Marine Department since 2009 to make boat electronics. Um, and we've been using Open Embedded in the Octo Project since uh, 2016. And I am a member of the Open Embedded Technical Steering Committee. And there are all the ways you can contact me if you are interested in doing so. All right, so here's the outline. We're going to go through the software supply chain, the Open Embedded build flow, and how it relates to software supply chain, talk about what SBOMs are, reproducible builds, and then the build system. So, start off with software supply chain. So, uh, when we talk about the software supply chain, uh, we can basically break it down into three main steps that happen whenever you're building up software. So, we uh, provision that software uh, from somewhere, uh, usually downloading it, the source code, or something like that. We uh, modify and combine it, so this could be compiling, linking in libraries, things like that. Um, and then we take the outputs of that and we uh, publish them or distribute them or generally make them available uh, for other stages. And this happens over and over and over again until we get the final thing that we want. So the things that we publish or distribute come back over here um, and get provisioned to be dependencies to get pulled into the next phase of the build. So when we talk about the software supply chain, um, there's actually um, a whole bunch of things that can go wrong at each step in here if we're not careful. Um, so every step along here, there are well-documented cases of these things happening out in the wild um, that have caused some pretty major problems for people. Um, and so the big thing about the software supply chain um, is that we want to be able to know if these things are happening. It's not necessarily that having a good software supply chain prevents them, but it does let you know that it's happening in the first place, which is the first step. So we can have uh, modifications to our software that is malicious or otherwise that can happen basically at any point. Um, and so we need to know uh, where this is. And because of our deep software supply chains, I think software supply chains are particularly susceptible to this. Also because of just the ease with which software is done. Um, there are such things as physical supply chain attacks if you're doing like manufacturing, but you know, you're generally talking about the movement of physical goods from one place to another. It's not bits flowing across the ether. So, you know, it's just the software supply chain can be particularly susceptible to this. And again, we can't protect what we can't see. Uh, regulatory agencies have started taking notice of this. There is the uh, US executive order and the EU Cyber Resiliency Act. Um, the executive order was passed uh, a couple months ago and the EU one was being worked on, but both of these sort of lay the foundation for some sort of regulation involving at least tracking what your supply chain is so that you know. Go ahead. Uh, so it's an executive order, but it's not actually a law. It's not, no, no. It's, yeah, this isn't like, a, you're not legally required to do, in, as far as I know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. I don't think you're legally required to do any of these things, but it is sort of laying the foundation that that could potentially be something that. I think if you're a member of the U.S. government or working for the U.S. government. Yeah, the, to there are some. Notes. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so cons consult your lawyers. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say this. I'm just. I I think it's something that might be on the horizon. So and and honestly, like, if we're shipping stuff to someone or using software or making it available for someone, we probably want to make sure that it's okay for them to be using it. So, yeah, you know, hopefully the, any government regulation should be the stick that doesn't need to be used, right? Like, we should know what's in our software. So what do we need to know about what's in our software? So when we have a piece of software, some sort of binary or something like that, we need to know what's in it, right? So where did it come from? Um, what version in it? Is it, um, if there's any software licenses that are in there, we would like to know what they are so that we can properly comply with them. Um, we need to know if the software has been tampered with, either maliciously or unintentionally. Um, if we're using software or giving software to customers or other people to use, um, we need to know if it's been tampered with so that we don't expose ourselves or anyone using our software to unnecessary risk. We need to, would like to know if it's vulnerable to exploits for the same reason. We don't want someone to be using our software and then have problems because they got hacked. And basically the question that we want to answer is, can we trace the binaries back to the source code? 
So this is the open embedded workshop. So now we're going to talk about open embedded and how it fits into this supply chain. So when you build something with open embedded, what you start out with is we've got some source code here. You keep that in Git repositories or tarballs or something like that. You've got some metadata, which are recipes that describe how to build that source code. And then you've got some policy information like how am I going to configure stuff and do I want to use system D or not or whatever. You chuck all of this into this magical tool called Bitbake <laughs> and it does a bunch of work and spits out this thing that we call a target image. <coughs> and you take that target image and you put it on your widget and profit, right? When we talk about a target image, it's sort of the generic term that at least I like to use for just something that Bitbake outputs in the deploy directory. Um, it can be your traditional like uh, you know embedded software that you'd flash in a Raspberry Pi, but we can actually do a whole bunch of other stuff, uh, you know, microcontroller firmware and PC and QEMU images and containers and package feeds and SDKs and all of this other stuff. So I'm, I'm going to talk about target images, but it really applies to all of these things. So it is a simplified build flow for how Bitbake actually accomplishes this. Um, we start out with some host tools over here. And these are the basic tools that you need to install in order to get Bitbake to run. So there's going to be your host compiler and Python and you know basically the list of tools and the documentation that says please install these before getting started. Your host tools. We're going to take those host tools and we're going to process some recipe metadata, which is going to pull down some source code. And we are going to use that source code to build the native tools and the cross-compiler. So these are tools that are designed to run still on your host PC. These are not cross-compiled themselves. Um, but the important thing here is that we're building most of the tools that you need to build software later on. So if you need the protobuf compiler later on in your build, we're actually building it internally. We're actually building the cross-compiler internally, so your host doesn't even need a cross-compiler in order to uh, use Bitbake. So we're building a lot of that internally so we know what the versions are and can keep all the dependencies sane and all of that sort of thing. Very minimal, try to minimize the host dependencies as much as we can. We're going to take those native tools and cross compiler and we're going to use them to process yet more recipe metadata which is going to download some more source code and this is all going to be cross compiled to generate the target packages which are designed to run on whatever your target system is, be that ARM or RISC-V or uh, x86 or whatever it is. And then we take those target packages with yet more recipe metadata and that recipe metadata says how to install all of these packages into our final target image. The way that Bitbake keeps all of this sane internally is using a sophisticated method of hashing. So at each task, uh, at each step along the way here called a task, um, it's calculating a hash that is the, uh, uh, it's called the task hash that describes all of the information necessary to do that step. So that's going to include all of the dependencies of that task. It's going to include the variables that affect that task's execution. It's also going to include the actual text of the code that the task runs. And all of the, that gets calculated together into a single hash called the task hash. And then that task hash is the input to any downstream task from their dependencies. So the task hash of one hash becomes the input in the hash calculation for the next task if that task depends on it. So by doing this, um, Bitbait can tell if something changes what it needs to rebuild. That's the primary reason it does this. So if, for example, something in your protobuf compiler recipe changes, that's going to change its task hash. And when that happens, that's going to invalidate all of the task caches downstream of that, which will cause Bitbake to rebuild your protobuf compiler, and then anything that depends on that directly or indirectly, all the way down to finally end up rebuilding the target image at the end. So because of this sophisticated method of hashing that we have to do this, we actually have a fairly strong beginnings of a software supply chain just internally to the way Bitbake does things because we can trace target images back to 
the original source code and the recipes that produce them because of this chain of hashes that we have. And uh, importantly, um, not only can we trace them back to the target packages, but we can trace this back to our native tools and our cross-compiler. Um, so we're actually having uh, fairly expansive coverage of the things necessary to produce a build just out of the box because of the way BitBake, BitBake does things. So how does this tie into a software bill of materials? So um, one way the software bill of materials is commonly described is it's like a nutrition label for your software. Um, and I think this is a pretty good analogy um, because a accurately describes how a software bill of materials is supposed to be a standardized encoding for that describes software. So most people can look at a nutrition label and sort of intuitively understand what it's trying to say. It's a standardized encoding for nutrition. So just like I can look and see what's in my food, a software bill of materials should be able to intuitively and easily tell me what's in my software. Um, and there might be multiple different SBOM formats that describe the same physical, uh, this describe the same software supply chain. So there's SPDX and Cyclone DX. Third one that I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, so there's a bunch of different formats that are designed to describe the same underlying software supply chain. Ultimately, what an SBOM is, is that it describes what's in your software, what we know about it, what we don't know about it, and how all the things that are in your software are related. So in this example, you can see uh, there's Carol's compression engine, which is included in Bob's browser, which we have partial information about. And that gets included in the, ac the application. And I like this graph because it's pretty easy to translate that back over here. You could pretty easily imagine that Carol's compression engine is something we produce as a native tool, and Bob's browser is some target thing that we produce from a recipe. So kind of all fits together pretty well. And conveniently, recipe metadata already has a whole bunch of the stuff that we already want in an SBOM. So we already have version information. We already have the source code URLs where we downloaded the source code from. We know licenses, build time dependencies, runtime dependencies. We know what CVEs we've patched. Um, we know the source files and the package files. And all of this is very uh, it's authoritative, which means we don't have to guess about it. Like We're the ones that, you know, generated this information, so it's, it's accurate, right? Like, we know what this is because we said this is what's in the recipe. So um, we're not guessing about what these things might be. So we have support for generating SBOMs in SPDX JSON format. That's the format that we chose to use was SPDX because uh, it had some pretty good tie-ins with community-wise, community and then JSON, because JSON is fairly easy to generate with Python. There's actually a whole bunch of different formats, including spreadsheets that you can generate SBOMs in for the lawyer people if you really want. And you, there's ways to convert. So you know if, if they really want a spreadsheet, you can convert to that. Five seconds after losing contact with All right. <laughs> <laughs> he concentrated. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to generate uh, SPDX uh, during your build. When you initialize your build environment, you could say inherit, uh, create SPDX in your local comp file, and then whatever you bit bake, the image will have the SPDX output alongside the, the main image, and we'll look at what that looks like later. Um, we do have, the, there is a version version of create SPDX, so there's SPDX 2.2. So when SPDX 3.0 comes out, you'll be able to choose between 2 or 3, and create SPDX will just give you the most recent version. So the way that this works is basically when we're processing recipes while we're doing our compiling and packaging and all of that, alongside that, we gen rerun another task that basically generates the SPDX data writes it out to some files, and then at the very end of the build, we uh, suck all these SPDX files together into a single archive and put it alongside the target image. Right, so our role in software supply chain is to describe what we know, 
but stay silent on what we don't know. And we've sort of taken this as a, uh, it's come up a few times uh, that people have asked, can we add something to SPDX? And it's like, well, if it's something that we know about, um, we can put that in there. But if it's something we don't know about, we're not really wanting to add it to our SPDX generation. Um, and primarily the reason for that is that there's a lot of other tools that can do SPDX related scanning and stuff like that. And it's not really, we may as well let those tools do those things, right? It doesn't make sense for us to be re-implementing all of this SPDX scanning stuff. Um, you know, we're providing just one piece of the picture, um, but it's basically a piece that you can only get from us. And I think we should just restrict ourselves to that piece and let other people provide the other pieces. So uh, this is basically just a list of all of the SPDX features that we can provide. Um, most of these are just straight translations from the bitbake variable that provides them, so they're not particularly exciting. Um, uh, we, uh, with the licenses, it's, it's kind of cool. We can include, if it's not a known SPDX license, we'll actually just slap the whole license text in the SPDX, which makes it very big, um, but means you have the whole license if it's not a known identifier. We've got all these other things, homepage URLs and all of that other stuff. Um, the source file listing with checksums, that one's interesting because that's what allows you to then trace back your binaries to their source files with the checksums. Also makes your SPDX quite large. Um, and we will scan the source files for their, uh, uh, the standard SPDX license comment thing that's in there and report on what those are if we find them. We know the packages we generate with our checksums. Um, and uh, Another cool one that we can do is the generated from debug data. So when we build a binary, we'll actually look through the ELF debug data um, and then trace that back to the recipe that provided it, which might not be the recipe you're currently building, particularly if you're doing static libraries. Um, so what that means is we can actually trace code across recipes. And so you can see that this executable used code from this other recipe most likely because of a shared library, um, be able to track that, which is really hard to figure out uh, any other way. So it's something that's really hard to, particularly static libraries can be really hard to detect by scanning afterwards. So it's really cool that we can provide that. Um, and obviously the build time and runtime dependencies, we have to know what all those are and they have to be correct or uh, the recipe's broken. So we just put those in there too. And uh, you know what? What types of recipes can we generate SPDX for? And it's it's basically everything. Um, you know, anything we can build, we can generate at least some level of SPDX for. Um, all of the on-target traditional language stuff is just basically just works. You don't have to really do anything for it. Um, and again, with all the native tools, uh, you know, you get those also. Um, the Linux kernel is another really interesting one. Uh, we're one of the few projects that can generate meaningful SPDX for the Linux kernel because um, it's also very hard to do without, unless you're actually building it. And support was added for SDKs and I'm sorry, I forgot who did that. I don't remember. Uh, someone did that. Might even be someone in this room. <laughs> anyway, you can, ask, you can generate SPDX for the uh, SDKs that you ship out to your uh, um, app developers if you want to do that too. Uh, and container images, that's another one. Like people talk about like, oh, it's really hard to get SPDX data from a Docker container. Well, we can, we can build Docker containers and we can generate the SPDX for it. Um, v image of, VM images the same way. Um, Rust and Go I have is under construction. So we can generate SPDX for the like base recipe that you're building. The thing that we're missing is um, processing all the cargo modules that also went into it and all the Go modules and things like that. So we need to finish that up yet so we can generate some good SPDX for those things. Um, yeah. So these are all the SPDX relationships uh, graphically laid out uh, that we generate. Um, so we'll start down here. So if you're building a recipe, uh, you'll get a uh, SPDX that describes the recipe itself. Uh, and all of this might change with SPDX3. So this is just how the SPDX2 <coughs> stuff works today. Um, we may change this in the future. So start with the recipe SPDX, um, and that's going to have the contains relationship on all of your source code files. So you can track the recipe to the source code that it built. 
The rest PS PDX is also what's going to contain your CVE information um, and, and just basically anything that's related to the source itself is going to end up in the rest PS PDX file. Oops, excuse me. Um, we list the build time dependencies with that build time dependency of relationship. So that's between recipes. So this recipe build time dependency has a build time dependency on this one. And then we actually go build it and generate the package files from it. And then you get these package SPDX. So you get one for every package you build. And those have the generated from relationship on the recipe SPDX. And they'll also get the generated from dependency for other recipes if they have the debug data. So this is how you can track your static libraries. As you'll see, package SPDX has that generated from dependency on some other recipe that it wasn't generated from directly. Uh, and then this package SPDX is going to have this contains dependency on all the files in the package with their checksums. And then due to some quirks in the way that SPDX works, <laughs> we have yet another document for each of them. Um, and this document uh, has the amends dependency saying it's providing additional information about the package SPDX. And this is going to have all of the runtime dependencies. So it'll say, Basically, what this runtime SPDX thing will say is the package in this document has a runtime dependency on the package in this document. And that's how we record the runtime dependencies of things. Um, and then the final thing you get up here is an image SPDX. So that's going to describe your entire root file system or whatever that you've created. And it's going to say it contains all your packages. Uh, it includes this other relationship on those runtime SPDXs just so that they get pulled in properly and you can tell that they're relevant to the image. And then the final thing we produce that is not SPDX is this image, uh, image index JSON file. Um, and I think I cover that later, so we'll get to that. Yeah, so some of the things we're working on to make this all better, which Probably isn't going to change for SPDX 2.2, but for 3.0, a lot of this should get a lot better. Um, we'd like to improve the relationships, obviously. The runtime SPDX thing is a little uh, clunky, so we'd rather not do that. Um, and other things like that, we'd like to be able to report specific build that a specific build happened at a specific time when we generate the SPDX. It should be possible with 3.0. Um, we'd also like to be able to pull in upstream source SPDXs. So if your project is using something like reuse or something like that, we should be able to pull in whatever SPDX comes from, or yeah, SPDX comes from that upstream repository uh, and just basically link it in and include it in our big archive that we create um, because that will put it all in one spot so you can find it easily. Like you could go back to the source and find it, but we could also just link into it and we can actually put it into our dependency graph that we generate. There might be a few other SPDX fields that we'd uh, like to include, and then again the build information, which come along with SPDX3. Just one question. Yes? Have you considered uh, if you have internal bug reporting tools to add that type of information? Well, this bug is reported and we fix it in its release and things like that. Um, we do. I mean, we do CVE tracking. I'm not sure what you mean by bug mm. reporting. I mean, when I work, we use Jira, right? Right. So you write the Jira ticket. Mm -hmm. What you could do is this release fixes this Jira ticket. Yeah, so you could do that with um, uh, like custom SPDX mm. uh, annotations, I believe they're called. Mm. Um, we don't currently have a way that you mm. could inject those into a specific recipe. Mm. It might be kind of a, I don't know, it might the be way, a little the way interesting we, to record that the, in the, the recipe. The way we did it was we enforced that all the commits uh, to a repo had a Jira ticket. So yeah. we checked the commit log right. for Jira tickets. And well, then we checked the Jira service, this closed or not. Right, yes. Okay, so one of the ways you could handle that, um, so SPDX is uh, um, designed to let documents, they are simultaneously... Uh, fixed in that there is a hash that represents a document and you're not mm -hmm. allowed to change it. Mm -hmm. um, but they are also designed to be extendable. Mm -hmm. So that's probably not something we would put necessarily in OE core, but you could 
very easily probably write some sort of script that would do that post-processing and then add the amends document for your recipe that described that. So that's probably the way you would want to go with that kind of thing. I love you for a great reason. Um, so you say that you do SPDX for containers. What does that mean? Um, As, right, so that would be like if you built a container image with Open Embedded, okay. you would have As the SPDX for using like Docker. You're right, like yes, that. yes, that's that sort okay, of thing. Good, good, they're, good. they're working on SPDX for Docker and yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's a hard problem yeah. and it's one that we've already solved. Yeah. <laughs> um, my other question, this has been brought up, I talked to Richard about this before, yeah. is um, part of the problem is like a lot of the license stuff that we gather is, you know, by hand. Mm -hmm. And license changes depending on how you build something. Yes, right? it does. Yeah. So one of the things that we've discussed, and no one's had time to look at it, is, and I was wondering if anyone's actually looking at this, is actually tainting the compiler so right. that we can kind of track where we're pulling mm -hmm. things in from and pull the SPDX from that. Yes. So um, SPDX uh, has the concept of the declared license mm -hmm. versus yeah. the um, concluded license. And we actually, uh, we report the declared license. If there was support, and, and we have the declared license on all the source files. Right. So if there was support to say specifically which source files that was probably a little more reliable than the debug data. If there's support to say these specific source files are in this binary, we could fill out the concluded license. Right. And that would be pretty cool to do. There, there are people working on adding support for sort of generically trying to figure out what source files end up in a build. Um, there was a talk at, the, at FOSDEM on yesterday about that, a tool that they had written It was in the SBOM dev room, and I don't remember the name of the tool. It was like 500% slower than building normally. <laughs> uh, it's still going to be faster than a falsology scan. Yeah, and I think the bigger problem was that the tool, at, uh, right now the tool is, uh, it makes your build single-threaded. <laughs> so, um, it's still uh, faster than a falsology scan. Is SPDX to a legal obligations thing, or what? Hermione? Or was it, what was it called? Uh, or did, did you mean something no, there's there's a different tool. It was, there was our Google mm -hmm. Summer of Code project, and I will look it up after my talk. But there there is a, do you buy? Build Recorder. You build Recorder, that was ah, it. Build yes, recorder. yes. So I think like if we could integrate something like that and make sane sense of it, yeah. um, that would potentially allow us to do that. And then you could say like, oh, the declared license doesn't match this concluded license. Like that's you yeah, should check something out. Yeah. yeah, or at least like, check that right, or at least make sure it's not, that, at least make sure the concluded license is a subset yeah. of the declared license, right? Yeah. And yeah. See, even with falsology scans, unless you're familiar with how that was built. Right. Yeah, yeah so you, exactly. You lose that information, right? Yeah, you yeah, have, yeah. Because mm -hmm. if you upload to pathology, you only have the sources. Right. Yeah, but you have no idea, I mean, yeah. right? Unless you know the layer that, that, that came from and how it was built, you're, 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 you're getting a declared license that's kind of low fidelity. Right, and yeah, that would definitely be something that would be awesome to improve um, and totally an avenue that we should go down eventually. Um, but yeah, we're not quite there yet. In other words, Patch is welcome. Yeah, Patch is welcome. And uh, like, I'm a little torn like as to whether that should be like an external tool like the build recorder or like NGCC would be I've probably been, ideal I've but been oof. For five years yeah I've it's been but yeah. yeah so the the other thing that I talked about in my talk yesterday was um, you know it'd be great if like the actual build uh, like the Mason and auto tools and stuff provided some of this information. Um, but uh, it would be, but like there's so, like people come up with new build systems all the time. It's like, oh man. <laughs> so it's, it's hard. Which is why I said doing it at the compiler level. The compiler level, yeah. Or, or if that build recorder thing, they were, they were talking about maybe using eBPF for the build recorder to make it more performance. Something like that, maybe. 
But yeah, that's definitely something we should look into because we could provide, I think, pretty good information on that. Any other questions before I move on? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm just reading to the basic stuff. It was the first time I heard about Smash it! <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the first time I heard about S bombs yesterday. You know, we, we deal with bombs all the time, but I'm trying to get my head around this. And I know about the the sort of SPDX, I think, but I've always considered that in terms of license compliance. So this is sort of sort of twisting me sideways a little bit. And yeah. is is this in terms of an S bomb? This is presumably one way of providing an S bomb. Is this like the, going to be the de facto standard? Is there going to be one? Are there alternatives? Who's there, driving that? Yes. So there are, there, like I said, there's uh, SPDX, um, which uh, is a Linux Foundation project. And it, they also got it, they got SPDX 2.2 to be an ISO standard, huh? um, which was convenient, I guess, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you like ISO standards. <laughs> um, uh, so they're working really hard on that. Um, there's also, uh, there's Cyclone DX is a different format. But again, like, the idea is that all of these things describe the same supply chain, the, uh, the, under, the same underlying supply chain. So yeah, there's different encoding formats, like different ways of formatting your nutrition label, but it's describing the same, you so know, box in crackers. Essence, you, right? you would think you could sort of pass from one format to another yes, format. Yes, so you really. can. There are conversion tools out right. there. Um, and so that's that's another thing, like we probably, well, we're not going to support anything other than SPDX in OE Core because there's conversion tools out there. If you want something else, you can and, convert it. And sort of lastly, we're all, well, I'm certainly thinking about, you know, um, open embedded operating system builds, embedded systems. Is this the same for applications developers? I mean, they're going to put an application on top of a whole raft of SPDX information in an SBOM which is their dependency input, mm -hmm. and then that sort of includes, as it were, into what they do with their own application dependencies, and they mm -hmm. use the same kind of system, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so the way that uh, SPDX is uh, set up is you can just link, you, you have multiple documents, like I showed, and you can link documents together um, by their hash, so you can say like, yeah. Um, so if, if you were doing like, if you're building your application completely outside of open embedded, yeah. like if you're building it in open embedded, you're gonna have a recipe that's gonna have all the information, so yeah. it should be pretty good there. Um, unless you're doing weird stuff like downloading during do compile, yeah. which please don't. But <laughs> um, uh, you know, or if you're doing something or like the Rust or Go case where you've got extraneous stuff that maybe isn't covered that would need to be augmented to figure out. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're just producing an SDK and people are compiling something and you're putting it on later mm, they um, yeah they'd need to generate their own s bomb and there's tools out there to do that but you could link that into the s bomb that we generate here and, right and, and very much lastly i mean so if we're talking to clients who've got you know android on an embedded right. device yep and maybe that android has come from some random country and doesn't have an s bomb that presumably is is about to be a really big problem for them and you know is, what is happening with that is, is I, I don't know on the, are you ta talking like regulatory I'm just, side I'm just of things? I'm interested, I mean obviously the, the, the decisions that have been made in history within Open Embedded have led to being in a really good position right. to handle yeah. this. Yes. And I'm interested in the wider embedded world, I mean m maybe this is for another time, but how, how Android, iOS, you know, how, how the rest of the world is doing this stuff and how that compares to what's happening here. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> nah. I, I'm not an Android developer. I, I, try, I try not to look at it if I can help it. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, it, I think it is getting pushed really hard. And I, there's a lot of advantages to S-bombs. And like another way to think about it is it's a way of, it's another way of describing your Software, right? It's metadata about your software so that, like, yeah, like the best thing to do is go back to source, right? If you, if you want the authoritative thing on what's going on, like, go back to source, right? But that's, it, sometimes it's more convenient to have metadata that is in an easily accessible format so you don't have to go back to the source to ask a question, like, you know, what CVEs am I? vulnerable to like I release you know like I released the software 10 years ago is it vulnerable to any CVEs right now like yeah you go back to source and do that but 
if you have metadata about it. It's, and really, I don't think it's any different than like the metadata that's included in like a Debian or an RPM package file, right? It's the same concept. It's information about your software. These are all good questions. This is the best, best group I've had for questions yet. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Directly question now. How do we make sure that the metadata about the software is actually accurate? Uh, philosophically or security <laughs> wise? <laughs> Pick your poison. So security wise, it's all checksummed so that there's those, they do checksumming and you can sign SPDX documents. I don't You'd have to do it outside of Open Embedded at this point. Um, so they do have signing and checksumming and all that stuff to make sure it's, you know, security-wise secure, uh, <coughs> not tampered with. Not tampered with. Philosophically, if the data in the recipe is wrong, it will be wrong in the SPDX and it should be fixed. Right. <laughs> so we're only as good as the recipe metadata. Anything else? All right. So, uh, actually tied into software supply chains is reproducible builds. So, why do we need reproducible builds? Well, the, one of the main reasons is that we want to be able to uh, resist attack. If we see that we've done a build and we know it's reproducible and it produces something different, we immediately know where to go to look to see what's happened along the way. And so this kind of ties into our software supply chain. It helps us find places where maybe something is wrong. Uh, there's things we can do to even go so far as to trust the compiler that we're using if we're not sure about it. Um, there's a technique called double, div double diverse compilation, but it does require reproducible builds in order to work in the first place. So we really want our builds to be reproducible for that reason. Also for quality assurance reasons, like we really want to test the actual thing. If, if we test something, we want to know that that's the same thing that's going to be sent out and used in the wider world. And so if the build is reproducible, you are, have a much higher guarantee of that being the case. Uh, if you're doing any sort of software updates that do binary deltas, then you really want reproducible builds to keep your updates as small as possible. And uh, you know it can also increase development speed because if nothing's changed, you don't need to rebuild it. Uh, if you ever need help getting someone to buy into reproducible builds, this, this website is great, reproduciblebuilds.org slash buy-in. They've got a whole list of things in greater detail than I've covered here. So I recommend that. From an open embedded standpoint, um, we're really interested in reproducible builds, um, sort of philosophically speaking, because when we say that a task has a task hash, um, what we really kind of want that to mean is that this task produces a specific output. Because it's not guaranteed that the same task cache will always produce the same output, but it sort of should be. Like that's kind of what the intention of a task cache is, is to say like this is what you're going to get when you run this task. So we'd like that to be reproducible so that we know we can trust our task caches and get the same thing every time. Uh, since Kirkston, uh, reproducible builds are actually enabled by default. Uh, but you can enable it for some versions prior to that by adding that inherit reproducible build .class to local.conf. Um, but your uh, upstream project is still responsible for correctly using this information. This doesn't mean if you magically include this, your build will be reproducible if your recipe builds something that encodes the timestamp in the binary, right? It just provides the information so that you can build reproducibly. It doesn't mean automatically every recipe is reproducible now. Uh, but for everything in OE core, uh, we do run <laughs> extensive testing on reproducibility uh, using the Yocto Auto Builder. Uh, so you can go to that website. Uh, hopefully it's up and uh, you can see the results. It wasn't last time I gave this presentation. <laughs> um, we test about 11,000 target packages. So we're not currently testing the native packages, but we would like, or native, uh, there's no native packages. So we're cur currently not testing the native stuff, but we'd like to do that eventually. And we test that across three different package formats and across multiple build hosts. So by testing across multiple build hosts, um, that means that we are checking that if you build a recipe on Ubuntu and then rebuild the same recipe at the same version, same hash on Fedora, you get the exact same binary output. So it doesn't depend on what host you're on. Um, 
So that's pretty cool. Uh, and then we have automatic diffoscope HTML output generated when packages are not reproducible, which aids in debugging. It, diffoscope is a really cool tool. If you've never seen it, it diffs anything. Um, it's awesome. Uh, the output from that can be quite large, though. <laughs> Lots has changed. A lot of things have changed, but it does help. Try to find out what's reproducible. You can sometimes easily see, oh, there's a date stamp in there. Pretty easy. You don't even have to go redo the build. Uh, you can extend this. So we do test OE Core, but that's only going to test the way that OE Core is configured um, on the Octo Auto Builders. So if you care about reproducible builds in your own system, you do actually have to test your build for reproducibility. Like we do try to make sure that everything in OE Core can build reproducibly, but that doesn't mean it will for you. You have to test it. So we've tried to make that really easy. Um, you can add this for uh, three lines of Python code to one of your layers. Um, just replace my image with whatever image it is that you want to test for reproducibility. Um, and then you run this, and I suggest running it overnight. It takes a very long time because um, it will do two, well, depending on how you have it configured, it will do two full builds from scratch with no S state. It will at least do one build from scratch with no S state, um, and you can choose whether the second build is, uses S state or not uh, if you don't want to wait. Or if, if you want to test if your S state is reproducible, you can do that by making the second build pull from S state. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, if you, if you want to have reproducible builds, I recommend that. All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about is the build tool tarball, and this is what gets you your S bombs all the way down. So the thing we're going to focus on right here is this build tools output from the target image. And the important thing to keep in mind is that the build tools output is basically just another SDK that we can produce. And we can produce S bombs for SDKs. And this replaces your host tools. So what this means is now you can trace your builds all the way back from your target image back through all your recipe metadata and have SBOM information and tracking and supply chain information for that, and the host tools, and have all the stuff that we need for that. So if you're on the truly paranoid track about these things, um, you can build that build tools tarball on an air-gapped system, a secure air-gapped system. You can sign that, distribute it to all your developers, and they can use that as the root of their subsequent builds, and you'll be able to trace, more or less trace, your final target images back to that secure system if you want to do that. So it's pretty cool. Something that came along for the ride when we got SDKs, uh, S-bombs for SDKs. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> as I may have mentioned, uh, yeah, so uh, SPDX2 has gone pretty well. We've just definitely generated a lot of output. Um, <laughs> is, is, is that the definition of things going well? Generating a lot of output. <laughs> yes. Okay. Awesome. Yes. We've generated a lot of, we can generate a lot of speak. I guess I don't have in this presentation. I have some slides that show the output. It's, uh, it's, it's quite large. So for, uh, for a, I did core image minimal. So it's like a 12 megabyte root file system and a 20 megabyte kernel for ARM 64. It's 150 megabytes of SPDX output. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a lot of information. So it turns out compilers are really good at compressing source code. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's a ton of output. Um, there's a lot in there. Um, you definitely need tools to deal with it, um, which has highlighted um, some of the shortcomings, which aren't necessarily our fault, but there is a sizable tooling gap right now in SPDX. We can generate way more output than any tool knows how to deal with. And um, because of our multi-document structure, most tools don't understand that either. They don't, they don't like it, they don't want to deal with it, even though it is valid SPDX. So we're doing lots of things that are valid SPDX that tools don't like. Um, and the spec isn't quite, yeah, so the specs aren't quite flexible to handle our complex document structure. I did yesterday was told about a tool that could maybe combine all of our SPDX documents into a single one, and I've looked at it, and maybe we can do that. We'll have to see. Uh, yeah, and we can't describe like how things are built and stuff like that, but SPDX3 will hopefully help with a lot of this. I'm on the 
I go to the tech meetings for SPDX3 and I was on the build profile working group, so I helped define what the build profile, which is supposed to describe a specific build, will be for SPDX. Um, and my hope is that uh, they will define a serialization format soon and then we will implement that in Open Embedded before the spec is released, give them a giant S bomb and say, here, your tools will need to be able to parse this, which will help both of us because it means we'll have early SPDX support and they'll have concrete examples of what this is actually going to look like. So I think that's, we're all really excited about doing that. Um, yeah. Yeah, any questions about anything? So the um, image SPDX, does that list the files or is it the packages? Oh, sorry, I never did that because the slide was in my presentation. So um, the, do, 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 do. Yeah. yeah, the image SPDX is just a whole bunch of relationship dependencies that say the image package. Things and everything in SPDX uh -huh. is grouped into a package, whether it's actually a package or not. So don't get too confused. Like even our recipes are packages, um, but our packages are actually packages. <laughs> um, so the SPD, the image SPDX has a package that represents the image itself, the root file system, um, and that's going to have a bunch of contains on the packages that got installed. Right. So there's no. There's not a direct relationship between the image and the recipe. You have to go through the package to the. So is there, is there a tool, or would it be sensible to write a tool that can take an SPDX and a root file system, and say the image SPDX says this is in it, and this is my actual file system. Right. Go yeah. through, look for like, files that are different, or files comparing that the checksums. Yeah. Yes. Or files that, that are new. Yep. That's exactly what, yeah, a tool yeah. like that would be really helpful. Yeah. That would, w hypothetically, would be helpful. Yeah, yeah yes, I guess. yes. <laughs> I mean, because that, that's how you could validate, right? Like, yeah. if, you, if you were shipped something, like, ideally, if you're getting an image from someone that was built with Open Embedded, or from anyone, mm. and they send you an SBOM, right? And you want to validate it. So maybe they've signed the SBOM, maybe they've signed the image, whatever. But you can say, like, okay, I'm going to actually look through your image and check some all the files and compare them to the SBOM and make sure that they match, right? And if they don't, then I need to figure out what's going on there, yeah. right? Um, so yeah, and then I didn't mention it because I didn't have the slide for it, but the image index JSON file, um, the way that SPDX documents are referenced is by their thing called a document namespace, um, which is not the file name. Uh, it's just a abstract handle for the document. Um, and so anytime you see a, a relationship between two uh, separate files here, like we have here, it's always going to be by that document namespace. And so we have this image index JSON file um, that just tells you, it's, it's not an SPDX thing, it's just something we came up with, but it basically tells you this document namespace is this file name. Because um, you can't really name the files after the namespaces because they have slashes and they're like URLs, so you, you can't. So we, we have that in there um, just to make it easier for you to actually cross-reference these things to files. Um, there's tools out there that are supposed to be able to, you can take all these files and load them into a database, um, and then you wouldn't, you wouldn't need that because it would look at the document namespaces and cross-reference them all. Um, it's kind of the idea, I think, of what it's supposed to work, but again, like I said, there's a bit of a tooling gap right now. Cool. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry, in the back. Yes, uh, maybe a bit tangential, but th there seems to be a convergence between sort of SPDX and, and you know, the supply chain, um, the ability to show what's in what we're delivering here mm -hmm. against an absolute you know, value, against a hash or something. And then earlier on, we were hearing about all the, the kind of the testing, the p-testing that we can do. And, you know, of course, that would be wonderful then to be able to say, okay, here's all the tests that went in against this hashed image that you've got. That would be cool. And then I'm thinking, okay, you know, I've got a vague idea of what these magical infosec people do with their penetration testing. Right, yes. Surely, I mean, it's like Metasploit, there's automated tests. Mm -hmm. is, is anybody kind of looking at or thinking about how you do 
like a, a security test equivalent. Well, I, I see there is security test equivalent of p-test, and like maybe build those outputs into into the deliverable manifesto, the SPDX. Or is that all just nonsense? Or no, I think that's uh, probably something that someone is looking at. Probably, yeah. Um, I'm fairly certain that the Open Chain folks are looking at this okay. with, with uh, IEC 2020 or whatever that ISO version is for IEC. Uh, ISO version of SPDX? Yeah, it, well, Open, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that'd be SPDX 2.2 is yeah, the ISO yeah, version. Yeah, yeah. So I know the, the Open Chain folks are, yeah. had uh, some security stuff that they were looking at. I don't know where that's at now, but yeah. yeah. And, and again, that, that type of thing is also not terribly difficult to add in after because the way it's structured is you can just make a new document that says, hey, this amends this, and look, I provided all these tests, right? So it is very much designed with that ability in mind. Um, SPDX3 will also hopefully make that a lot easier because they're simplifying the way that uh, things are described, so it'll be hopefully even easier. They might, they might even be working on like a testing profile um, like we have a build profile that's supposed to say like this was a build that was done. There might be, I'm not sure, but it wouldn't surprise me if there was someone working on a testing profile that said like we ran these tests on this. And you can say like, oh yeah, we ran these tests against this image. That would be really cool. I didn't even think about that. Uh, any other questions? I have a very stupid question. Sure. Uh, um, Okay, so you add the inherit and it spits out the SBOM. Where does it spit out the SBOM? It is parallel to the image file name with dot SPDX. So, I mean, like, do, like deploy. Yeah, images. it's like core image minimal dot SPDX dot tar dot GZ or something like that. I'm sorry, I should have put that slide oh, in here. Uh, yeah, it's, it's next to the image. Deploy image uh, dot SPDX dot JSON. That's the image SPDX. That's the image SPDX. Right, so the, you have to remember, we, we put all of this stuff into a big archive. So there's, I prob this probably shouldn't be in deployed here, but I didn't know where else to put it. So there's actually the image SPDX file, which is just the SPDX that says this image has a whole bunch of external document references, contains to all of these things. Mm -hmm. And then there's another file that is, um, yeah, hang on, I, I just did it. Um, yeah, so I always click that one wrong. Here? Yes, yes. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, so if you look here, so here's your root file system, core image minimal, .ext4, targz. Um, this file, this spdx.index.json, that's that index file that maps the spdx namespaces to file names. Um, this is the spdx for the image itself, which has all those contains relationships. The thing you want is this one, this core image minimal, yada, 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 dot spdx.tar.zst, that's, that's your SBOM, your complete SBOM. Um, these files, probably should move those because I think they're just confusing. Yeah, um, I don't remember the name of it, but if you go up one into, uh, I think it's like the license deployer or something. Yeah. It, it's where, where like all the license wrangling used to happen, and I think it still happens there. Yeah, it, it really just needs to be done yeah, in the work yeah. of the image instead yeah. of here. I don't remember why. It, 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 it kind of clutters, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it does, it does. Yeah. It's confusing. Yeah. We should change that. Because you don't, you, this stuff is all in this archive, and this archive is your SBOM. This is just the stuff. So, um, yeah, we, we, can, we can fix that. Yes, in the back. Um, okay, this is the site of the dev developer we create that as bomb and let's assume we have a client that is asking it because whatever the president of the United States wants to have this, that's a huge amount of data that the client has to parse, to check, to analyze. And I'm afraid that my client will ask me 
what is this? <laughs> right. What can I do with it? Are there, besides the side of the tooling to produce it, is there also an ecosystem of toolings to do something with this data? Yeah, so there is. Um, and that kind of goes into that tooling gap. A lot of the tooling is for simpler S S bombs. Um, and I, the tooling will catch up, I think, once we have good examples, like, because we can generate exa good examples. I think the tooling will catch up with us, um, basically. Um, but I think the idea is, like, if you're, you know, you, you'll be able to load this into something and then run queries against it, I think is kind of the ideal case, right? So you could, you know, you could, load this S bomb that you've gotten from some vendor into a tool and then say, you know, what version is OpenSSL, right? Things like that, right? Does that make sense? Or like run queries against like, you know, well, is there GPL v3 in here? Stuff like that, right? So at the moment there isn't that much going on. No, this. there's a ton going on. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Like there's, there's a project called Daggerboard um, that uh, is trying to ingest SPDX documents and provide that database that you can run those queries against. Um, last I tried, it was like six months ago, last I tried they, they couldn't take our stuff, it was too much. Um, and some of the, some of the other things that kind of got us was the, the way the relationships were phrased in SPDX2 meant that some of them are kind of weird and backwards. They're not the way you would expect them to be, although I was assured it was valid SPDX. <laughs> so some of the tools like, why, why is this backwards? I don't understand. And it's like, well, it's because of the way they're phrased. They, we can only write them that way. Um, yeah, so, uh, and again, like, yeah, I, I don't expect SPDX3 to be some magic bullet, but they are addressing a lot of these issues in SPDX3 to make it hopefully better. And uh, yeah. They, they can't change SPDX too much right now because it's the ISO standard. So, you know, I, and I think the SPDX 2.2 2 .2 tooling will get better. So don't, don't assume that like this is all worthless right now. But, and I mean like it's all pretty simple JSON data. So you could write your own tools if you really wanted to parse through some of this stuff. Um, it's not horrendously complicated. Um, how big is the target? Right, yeah, okay. So this is, uh, yeah, so you've got, uh, what do we got? So the, the compressed tar file is, is that right, 134K? That wasn't too bad. I was expecting it to be a lot bigger. Oh, that's compressed. Yeah, it's much bigger on compressed. It's all, it's all text JSON, so it compresses really well. <laughs> How big is it uncompressed? Um, uh, let's see. Is it it's DU, right? Three, it's 3.2 megabytes. I don't know why that one's so small. I need to look at that. I think it's normally bigger than that. Oh, right. I didn't include the source files. Yeah, yeah. So this is this was generated without listing the checksums of all source files. You, when you include that, it really gets big. Um, that's the difference. So this is uh, 134K compressed and 3.2 megabytes uncompressed. Um, so it's not too bad. But yeah, when you include the source files and their checksums, it gets huge really quick. Because not only do you have all the source files and their checksums, you have all the relationships that say, yeah, it gets it gets verbose pretty quickly. Um, not verbose, I'd say, but it, you know, you, you need all that information, but it's, uh, you, you end up with generating a lot of it. So There's a couple of uh, options um, that you can use to generate like pretty SPDX JSON, because otherwise it's just all one line of JSON for each file, which is not the best, but there's like an SPDX pretty option you can set that'll make it human readable. Um, and all the individual files are also in the build directory and stuff, so you can go find them if you want to look through the individual files for each recipe without having to extract the tarball. But you can also just extract the tarball. Um, sort of what it looks like. So you can see like, so you see like, you know, recipe kmod.spdx.json. So that's the one that describes the recipe. Um, there'll be like a runtime 
kmod spdx that describes the runtime for the kmod package and not shown is kmod.spdx, which is the package, right? But you might have multiple packages and runtimes that all map to the same recipe, right? Um, yeah, like sysvinit pid of and sysvinit are probably two packages generated from the same sysvinit recipe. But you get two package files and then the one recipe file. Two packages, two runtimes, and one recipe, right? So hopefully that makes sense. Anything else from anyone else? Are there any, or do you know of any project that um, generates SPDX data on a similar level of complexity as uh, Open Embedded or the Okta project does? Or yes, uh, Zephyr also there? can okay. produce this for the, the Zephyr side of things. So they've also, they're also uh, pioneers in complicated SPDX generation. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, they, they have the basically a similar problem, right, with Zephyr, um, where they're generating a lot of data and the tooling is like, what's going on? <laughs> so. so my fear would also be if, uh, yeah, we're the only one generating this, or the Yacht project, if there is no consumer or no one will ever build tooling around it or use it, actually. Yeah, I mean, so I... It's such a bunch of data. Yeah, like, like I said, the, the tooling is still being worked on, like we're generating very complex SBOMs. Valid, but complex SBOMs. And so the tooling is also rapidly changing, and I, I do think it will catch up. And that's the other reason that like, getting uh, ahead of SPDX 3.0 is really good, because hopefully that will also mean when people write tools that are compatible with SPDX 3, they'll just more or less be compatible with our stuff. Because so that we will be hopefully one of the like yeah. example things of like, if you can parse this, then your tool is probably pretty good. <laughs> so that it's not a write-only format. <laughs> it is not a write-only format, right? And then, like I said, yeah, yeah. Like I said, like, you know, you can, you know, if it were me, I would archive this off on, like, you know, I, I make consumer electronics. I archive this off with whenever I make a release to a customer so I can go back to it if I need it, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. So it's there. Do I have a use for it today? No but I also can't see into my crystal ball and know when it will be really useful, right? So that's, that's kind of the idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyone else? I will. <laughs> okay.